series for a little bit. Uh, and, and when I was started as a youth pastor, it was about, anyway, some years back, I started as a youth pastor at a church called Glad Tidings Church in Victoria. And, uh, oh, we got some woot, woots for GT. And uh, when, when, I, uh, when I was about to become a youth pastor, I had, I had very little experience. I, I, had, I had very little um, uh, knowledge. I had done very little studying. I just uh, honestly wasn't really prepped for it. I, I don't know, I don't know uh, if you know this, but God often uses people that aren't very prepped for things to do incredible things. But, uh, so I just stepped into it and went for it. I became the youth pastor all of a sudden, full-time paid. And I, I was like, I need to read or I need to learn some things. I need to figure out how to do this. And so there were a few books that were really key for me in that time. One was called uh, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. I've talked about that a few times, but it, it is a powerful book on prayer. It really changed my life in so many ways. But the other book was called Do Hard Things. And uh, the subtitle for the book, Do Hard Things, is A Teenage Rebellion Against Low Expectations. A teenage rebellion against low expectations. This book fired me up because it was, uh, it was actually teenagers writing about their own life and how they had sort of pushed to accomplish things that, that were beyond what anyone expected, beyond what anyone uh, thought that they should do. They, they wanted to, to, to try hard things. They wanted to uh, exceed expectations. And, and basically, they started saying that culture's expectations of them were too low. So they just had to, they had to push beyond. On that. It wasn't enough to meet expectations. They wanted to uh, exceed expectations. And so uh, I read that book and I thought, that's what we got to do. As a, as a youth pastor, I'm going to do that uh, for my youth. I'm going start to start to tell them that they can accomplish more, that, that they can dream bigger, that, that they don't have to listen to what culture says about them. God says something different. You know, God's got, God's got dreams and hopes, and, and he's got his Holy Spirit that he wants to empower you, that you don't have to think within some small little box, but you get to dream way outside of the box. And, and so every time I meet with a, a student for a donut, those years were, were when I filled out the most. But uh, he, he, you meet, meet over a donut or chat at youth or, or, or be at their high school and chatting with them. I'd always want that to be part of my language, part of my culture, as is is I want you to know that there's more. I want you to know that you can dream bigger. I want you to know that you can accomplish greater. And all that was really awesome. I started feeling like people actually started believing me. People started believing that, and maybe that's true, I, I can dream bigger, my imagination can start to run wild, I can start to expect more uh, out of my life, I can start to expect more out of what I can accomplish, I, 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 I can start to see it, and, and we were getting excited, it was awesome, but the problem was, over the years I started realizing that, that, that dreams are easy to have, starts are easy, things are easy to start. But at some point, everything gets hard, and it's at that point that we have to decide if we want to commit and push through or not. It's at that point we have to decide if we're going to plow through that thing or if we're just going to sit back and say, ah, I liked the dreaming stage, I liked the starting stage, I liked when things were fresh and exciting, but, but and this has kind of gotten hard, and when it got hard, I'm not sure if it's worth it for me anymore. I'm just going to try something else. I'm going to dream for something else. I'm going to believe for something else, and I'm going to pursue something else. I think our culture has taught us that that's probably a pretty okay way of handling things. If it gets hard, maybe it's not the right thing, you know? If it gets too hard, maybe, maybe you need to find an easier route. Maybe you need to get on a different path because if it's hard, then that's not nice. You want a, you want a life that, that, you know, is, is easy and, and is quick and you can, you can just move on through and you can, just, you can just carry on. Our culture has gotten super weak. It's gotten super soft, you know. Just this, the expectation is that people should just be able to roll over on life and just let life like rub its tummy and just let it happen. This is good. This is life, and this feels good. And this is nice. And if it doesn't feel like this, something is wrong. The Bible doesn't teach us that. 
The Bible actually teaches us very differently than that. The Bible shows us actually that hard things are okay uh, to push through, that hard things are, are worth it sometimes, that, that we're actually meant to have some grit in our life, that we're actually meant to have uh, some, some force in our life, some, some, some dis, discontentment with just turning away when things get hard or just bumping into a wall and standing there and hoping the wall will fall over, that we're actually meant uh, to sort of become a little bit hardened with soft hearts but hard heads. There's this uh, story in the Bible of this uh, prophet, his name's Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is bumping into these challenges with all of the people. He's supposed to speak into Israel, and Israel's not listening, and so God says to him one day, Ezekiel, I've made Israel's heads hard, but I have made yours harder. And so he says, I'm going to, this isn't going to be, don't worry, they're nice and soft, you just walk up and it's going to be easy. He said, no, it's going to be hard, but guess what? I'm giving you everything you need to pound through it, to push through it, to fight through that hard thing, to crush that wall that's in front of you, to to dig a little deeper, to to plow through what needs to be plowed, not just to slow to saunter up to your problems and see if you can get through, because all of us are going to face problems. All of us are going to have, uh, have hard times, and God wants to make you hard for those hard times. Not hard hearts, but hard heads. Strong, strength, some grit. A while back, I was chatting with a, with a friend, and, um, and uh, that friend was wondering about, about giving up on a, on a, a, a significant commitment uh, that they had made. And, and they, were, they were questioning uh, some of this and just wondering, well, should I, should I follow through on this or not? Where should I go with this one? What should it look like? And uh, as, as we chatted, I, I, just wanted to, I, just, I just wanted to get to the place of like, no, it, it, you're, 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 you're laying over. You're laying back and just letting the next big thing inspire you and excite you. Right now is the time to push. Right now is the time to get through. Right now is the time to dig in the heels and push a little bit forward. Right now is the time where you need that strength. And, and uh, we prayed together. I went home. I called Kendall on the way. I, I started telling her the story. We've worked with uh, this, per- this person for quite a while. Uh, this has been someone that we, we've walked with for, for years and years, actually. And, uh, and, uh, and I went home and said, look, this, this person's struggling with this. And it just feels like they're, they're just going to lay over. And, and just just not push through in the time when they most need to push through. I said, I wish they could just find that that like that g- grit, you know. That's what they need. They need grit. It wasn't a very holy word. The grit it doesn't see. I don't see grit in the Bible. I don't see the word grit in the Bible. But that's what we need. We need some grit. We need faith with teeth. You know, we need faith with hard heads that are going to push through. We need faith with, with horns that are, going to, that are going to dig through some things. We need faith with hoofs that are going to push. I don't know what, you want to, what picture you want, but we need a faith that's going to plow a little bit. Faith is going to dig a little bit. When hard times start to come, we need a faith that says, I'm not going to turn from this. I'm going to push into this. I made a commitment. Now is not the time to quit on it. When we'd rather quit than commit, we need true grit. That's the one. That's the one. When we <laughs> you guys did good. In the first service, I said, you know what? I might not get a great response in the second, so let's celebrate that really well in the first. But you guys did well in the second. You, you, you really nailed it. So when we'd rather quit than commit, that's when we need to find true grit. We bump into a wall, say, you know what? I'm <laughs> just a minute, man. So I feel like that's sometimes our, our, our perspective in life. Oh, man, marriage feels hard. <laughs> Walk away. Oh, I'm tired of budgeting. <laughs> you know? Do you know what I mean? Oh, my job doesn't pay me enough, and they don't give me enough benefits. <laughs> like, just like, this isn't an inspiring life to follow. This isn't anything. This is, this is just kind of, why, why are you just giving up? Instead, what does it look like to say, I'm going to give my life to this. I'm going to pursue this. You know, we're in a time right now where divorce rate is higher than it's ever, than it's, than it's ever been, as far as I can tell. And, and also careers are changing more frequently in someone's life than, any, than, than times past. 
Because everyone's trying to figure out, oh, where's the place that's finally gonna make me happy? Where's the one that's finally gonna get it right for me? And I just feel like we need a culture, especially our Christian culture, to be in a place where we say, no, this isn't perfect right now, and this is hard right now, but God has made me hard for this. God has given me what I need for this. God has given me some grit so I can push through this thing. I really feel like God wants to do that with us. And so there's two chunks of scripture that I have for you today. Uh, one is written by a guy named James. And uh, James is the brother of Jesus. We talked about him a little while ago. I love, I love anything that comes from James because James didn't really believe his brother Jesus was the son of God. And then uh, Jesus died, rose from the dead, and James decided, I believe so much that he's the son of God that if they try to shut me up about talking about him, then I'll just die for it. And so he did. They killed him because he believed in Jesus being the son of God. And then, and then we're also going to read about Paul. And Paul is also a great guy to read from because Paul uh, so, was so certain that Jesus wasn't the son of God that he would try to put in prison uh, and kill anyone who believed that uh, until he met with Jesus face to face. And at that point, he decided, well, I'm going to follow Jesus with my whole life all the way until he was also killed for saying that Jesus was the son of God. These guys are some pretty... Credible sources for us. Both of them walk through junk in life. Sometimes I think that when we look at some of what we face in life, it's like, man, compared to what they face in life, it's just not worth comparing. They, they were just going, just to be a Christian, they were mocked, they were made fun of, they were ridiculed, uh, they lost friends, and then most of these guys that followed Jesus in the early days lost their lives for it. And for, for us, sometimes, like, huh, I don't know, I could use $2 more an hour, so I don't want to commit to that. It's like, what? What's, what's, wrong with, uh, what's wrong with us that we can't get a hold of this? And so let's hear what these guys have to say about it. James 1, 2 to 4. James, the first part of James, the very first verse of James is basically him saying, hello, my name is James, I'm going to write you a letter, here it is. And then the second, the very first topic he goes to is this. He says, consider it pure joy. I want to stop you there for a second. So don't read ahead. I see you looking at the screen. So the eyes over here, okay? <laughs> Consider it pure joy. So he's about to talk about something that we're supposed to consider pure joy. And what he doesn't say is, it is pure joy. He says, consider it pure joy. He doesn't say, this naturally happens to be a joyful thing in your life. He says, consider it pure joy. In other words, he's about to talk about something that isn't usually perceived as joyful. He's about to talk about something that usually people don't decide to assume is joyful. And he's about to say, it's time that you think of it as joyful. I want you to consider this a joyful thing. I want you to rethink how you think about this thing. I want you to allow Allow your brain to start to tell you and remind you over and over that what I'm about to tell you is a joyful thing, that you can receive it with joy, that you can consider it with joy, because what I'm about to talk to you about is a circumstance that feels like a big challenge in your life, a big difficulty in your life, a big overbearing uh, boulder that's rolling into your life, but you can consider it with joy because the thing that you know that that boulder doesn't know is that you have a hope in Jesus that is bigger than that boulder and on the other side when the boulder is crushed and you're standing in the glory of Jesus you'll be in a good place so he can be joyful so here's what here's what uh, J James is saying hey I just want you to think differently about what I'm what I'm going to talk about this is the very first thing he says in his only letter he says consider him pure joy my brothers and sisters Whenever you face trials of many kinds. Pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Whenever you face a trial, well, what if it, what if it gets really hard in my life? Yep, pure joy. What if my wife and I start fighting? Pure joy. What if my kids are rebelling against me? Pure joy. What if I feel stressed about, about work? Pure joy. What if my coworker makes fun of me? Pure joy. What if I'm bullied at school? Consider it pure joy. How am I supposed to do that? Not by worldly understanding, not by logic, but by recognizing that there's a heaven that we're living for. There's an eternity that we're part of. There's 
there's an expectation that's in our heart that isn't rooted in this world. And so when the world can't give us what we need, we can still be joyful about what's ahead of us after this world. It says, consider it with joy. Even those things. Even those things. It said, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. If you want to know perseverance, you need trials. If you want to know what it is to have true grit, you can't do that without trials, right? No one ever says, I just persevered through a, an ice cream sundae. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. True grit, you know? No one ever says that. No one ever says, I just went to the bank and, and, uh, and, uh, and my, my statements are way better than I thought. I'm actually in a really good place. I'm going to buy a, a three houses. So uh, anyways, I'm persevering. No one ever says that. Because we know perseverance only comes through trial. Perseverance only comes through challenge. Perseverance only comes through difficulty. And yet the Bible and James, who's walking through trials, who's walking through difficulties, who's walking through challenge, who's trying to lead a church in the Roman Empire that is persecuting the church in the Roman Empire, uh, he's trying to lead that group of people. And he's saying, hey, let's all just consider it pure joy when we are dealing with any single trial in life. Let's just consider it that way because it produces perseverance. It's the only way. For them, perseverance is good. For us in our culture, we say perseverance isn't necessarily necessary, right? Oh, I don't really need perseverance because what I do in my culture is when I have a hard time, I just find a different route. I find an easier path. So I don't need to persevere at all. Perseverance is, is not really a good thing at all because that must mean that I'm, I have a life that's not good. Because we say that if something is hard, it must not be good or it must not be right. But what if God actually land some of those things in your life so that you learn what perseverance is. It says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, when it comes to trials, we tend to think, how can I get out of it? Rather than what can I get out of it? Often with trials, we're thinking, how can I get away from this trial and do something different? How can I try to close my eyes and close my ears and pretend this trial doesn't exist and, and just move away? How can I get away from this challenge as fast as I can? It's hard and it's uncomfortable. How can I move away from it as fast as I can? I wonder if sometimes instead of thinking, how can I get out of this, we need to be thinking about what can I get out of this? What am I supposed to learn? What am I supposed to grow in? What's supposed to develop in me? Who am I supposed to become by the end of this? What is, what is growing in me? We know that that works with things like the gym. You don't go to the gym and think, oh, this is so awesome. It hurts so bad. No, no problem. It's all good. No, we know that it hurts, but we know also what it's going to accomplish. And we say that it's worth it. People, people who go on diets, come on, no one actually enjoys that most of the time. Like, I, I like candy, okay? I just like candy and popcorn <laughs> with lots of butter and sriracha. Anyone done sriracha popcorn? I love sriracha popcorn. You know, if, I, if, I, if my wife says I'm getting a little fuller uh, in, in stature, do we get an amen on that? Okay, we're, we're alive here. Uh, she puts me on a diet. <laughs> she doesn't put me on diets, but she sometimes strongly encourages with threats. But... Uh, <laughs> If she pushes me that direction, uh, then I'm going to say, well, okay, it's probably worth it. You know, uh, I'll, 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 get, I'll get in better shape. I'll be stronger. I'll, I'll be able to, you know, walk upstairs and not have to lie down, and that'll be good. Uh, so, so, okay, maybe it's worth it. But in the meantime, I'm not going to be happy that I don't get to eat that and don't get to eat that and don't get to do that and don't get to do that. But I know it's worth it. Here's what, here's what James is saying the same way. There's something that is worth it in the midst of your trials. If you will persevere through, you will find it. If you won't, you won't. If you never persevere through anything, you never get to see God, some of God's greatest work in your life. Most, I think most of God's greatest work in your life comes on the other side of the hardest work that you have to put in. That you've got to work for this thing. 
And sometimes as Christians, we've, we've taken our cultural understanding and then we've Christianified it. Or we've said, okay, our culture says that hard things are not good, so we should just have easy lives, make more money, uh, be happier, do all these things, blah, blah, blah. And then we've said, oh yeah, well, we're Christians, so we believe Jesus said that. So Jesus said, you should have more money and you should have nicer cars and your car should never break down and you should have only good friends and, and they should all treat you really nicely and you should have the best clothes and do all this stuff. And because, how do we know? Because because Jesus said. But here I see that there's trials and it's difficulty. And when our Christian understanding is like that, then we say, well, why did I just get sick? Or why did I just lose that friend? Or why did that tragedy just strike my family? Or why did I just have to deal with that thing? What is going on here unless we understand that the Bible recognizes hard things, trials in our lives as things that we get to persevere through, then we will always be questioning our faith, always be questioning questioning our God because we're saying, I thought this was supposed to be easy, and God never said that to you. God never said this is supposed to be easy. He's, James said, persevere through, and then he says, let perseverance finish its work so that it may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So then Romans 5, this is Paul, he's going to speak about it. He says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that our suffering produces perseverance. He says, suffering is great, because perseverance comes from it. You know, yesterday, uh, I always work on my sermons early on the week, feel like I'm doing pretty good. Saturday, I take a bunch of time refining it. Last night, I was, uh, it was about midnight. I felt like I was done my sermon. It was going to end right there. I was going to say, how good would it be if we're a church who perseveres? How good would it be if we're a church who plows forward and, and believes that we can push through some things and all that? And I was going to end it off right there. And then I went to bed and God started speaking. I'm like, God, bad timing. <laughs> Don't do that. I went to bed and, and, uh, and, and this, the, the clincher for me came together. In Romans 5, 3 to 4, what I just said, says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. I was going to leave verse 4, so I didn't really understand it. Right after it says, perseverance, character, and character, hope. So perseverance creates character and character creates hope. That's what, that's what it says next. And for me, I thought, God, why, why did you put hope at the end? Why did Paul put hope at the end of that thing? Because for me, there's no point in persevering unless I already have the hope. Unless I have the hope of eternal, uh, of eternal uh, glory, of, the, of, of redemption that God wants to give, of heaven. Unless I have that hope in my heart, why would I persevere through hard things? Why wouldn't I try to make my life as easy as possible? In fact, Paul in another spot in scripture says, if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, then we should be pitied more than any people on this earth. Why? Because we're going to live hard lives. Because we're going to invest our lives in other people and serve other people and care for other people and generously pour into other people and walk with people when they're hard to walk with and be patient with people when they're hard to be patient with and forgive people when they're hard to forgive and apologize when it's hard to apologize. That's who we're going to do. Why? Because we have a hope in Christ. And so for me, I'm thinking the hope is what compels the perseverance. So why is it at the end? And so I went to bed and said, well, I guess I'll just leave that part out. <laughs> Let's hit the hay. And midnight, I felt like God said, Evan, you think that hope is, is your hope, but that hope is for everyone around you. That hope is for everyone who sees you persevering. That hope is for the character that develops in you through perseverance. It's not for you, it's for them. And so, so, so I started imagining this. See, see, anyone who decides they want to follow Jesus with their life has this hope in their heart, right? They have this hope that sits there and now I've got this hope and that's great. And if we never turn that into perseverance that no one ever sees that hope, act it out. We say, oh, I'm so hopeful for eternity. Isn't this great? And they're like, no, what do you mean? What's eternity? We say, oh, I don't know, it's just in my heart. And so anyways, bye. 
and, and, and no one ever gets to see it, but instead, when, when I've got that hope in my heart and I face, a ch- I face a challenge, I can persevere through it. When I persevere through it, character starts developing in me, and people look at me and say, how is it that you were able to deal with that tragedy in that way? How is it that you were able to forgive that person in that way? How is it that you were able to take that demotion at work and you were able to, to be walked on all over? How is it that you were able to, to persevere while your marriage was in that state? How is it that you can forgive your kids over and over? How do you get that kind of character? Oh, I persevere because of a hope in my heart. Do you want it? And all of a sudden, they're seeing something in you that is bigger than they can do themselves. Our perseverance is what makes the hope in us become visible to others. So Paul, who wrote this, he says, perseverance to character and character, hope. There's a story in Paul's life. And he's been out and he's been doing some ministry. He's been healing people and, and preaching and sharing the word about Jesus and doing all this stuff. And, and uh, so he gets put in prison because of that. Worship team, you can come and join me if you like. So him and Silas get put in prison because of this. And it's in Acts 16. It says, at about, at, or about midnight... By the way, Paul, God doesn't just talk to me at midnight. He also does some cool stuff in Paul and Silas' life at midnight. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Do you, you know that is one of the sweetest verses on perseverance I know? They're in prison. And these aren't like Canadian nice prisons, get nice meals, you know, you're taken care of, you're looked after, you can't go outside, but you're, you're at, least, at least somewhat safe. No, these prisons are like, you go there to die. You go there to be forgotten. You go there to suffer. You go there to be tortured. You go there and, and, and you've probably already been tortured and you, now you're just going to bleed out. That's what these prisons are like. And so Paul is in prison and Sil- Silas are in prison and you can imagine they might be like, oh, I can't believe this. This is the worst. Following God is tough. I hate this. I'm tired. Let's go to sleep and complain. Pretty common, actually to hear a Christian complaining. God, I thought you were God. Shouldn't you be able to help me in this situation? Help yourself. You got the Holy Spirit in you. You got strength to walk through that thing. He was, oh, I can't believe sometimes we hang our heads. Instead, they start singing praises. Here's Paul having glory in his sufferings. Here he is in prison, and they start singing songs, singing praise. Sometimes we think worship is just the fluffy stuff we do before the sermon. Worship is power. Worship is perseverance. Singing is sometimes hard. When you're in challenging times, I don't want to sing. Sing it out. Watch what starts to happen, right? So they're singing there. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake, such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prisons were shaking. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Crazy situation. They're singing, they're persevering, and then God shows up. Prison doors swing, uh, swing open. Chains fall off of them. And they're like, whoa, this is crazy. And you imagine this mass exodus. Vroom, we're out of here. It's crazy mayhem. We're all done. And, but, but, but what we're going to see is very different. It says, the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. So the prison guard jumps up, he goes, oh no, an earthquake, chains fell off, prison doors are open, and he knows that, that he's on watch for these guys. He knows that if these guys got away on his watch, he's going to deal with much worse than suicide. He's going to deal with a, 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 a beating and lashing and, and torture that the Romans can give to him, and then he's going to be killed. And so suicide is his only option at this point. He thinks, I'll just kill myself, and it'll be done, and, and we'll be all over and it's so extreme, right? But then here's Paul. He said, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. What? As far as I can tell, Paul and Silas are the only two Christians in the place. 
They start singing and persevering. They start calling on God. What happens? All of these other prisoners, something starts happening in them. So when the prison doors open, they know that if any of them leave, that prison guard is dead. But instead, something has shifted in each of them so that they each stay in their cell, voluntarily making themselves prisoners so that that prison guard will not be hurt. That's character, isn't it? Perseverance led to character. We go to jail and instead of complaining, we're gonna worship, we're gonna sing, we're gonna believe, we're gonna call on God, we're gonna rejoice in our suffering, we're gonna glory in our suffering, we're gonna consider it pure joy when we face trials of all kinds and we're gonna sing to God and when we do, the earthquake is gonna shatter these prison doors, the chains are gonna fall off and instead of us running out and, and, and just counting the cost and letting that guy die, we're all gonna stay here in this spot because we've now decided that through perseverance we can recognize character says I can think about the jailer before I can think about myself. I can think about the one that doesn't know Jesus before I can think about me who does know Jesus and all of a sudden hope shows up in the prison cell. All of a sudden hope makes its way in. This isn't for Paul and Silas. This isn't even for the prisoners anymore. They've all received the hope. The character has come. But now the character is the sign to the jailer that there is hope for him. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And he then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> No, that hope is not for you. The hope at the end of perseverance is not for you. You persevere because you have hope, but when you persevere because of that hope, you will develop such character that looks so significantly different than the world around you that you would be willing to stand in a prison cell and do life in jail, imprison yourself maybe with a rebellious kid, imprison yourself maybe with a with a spouse that doesn't seem to love you, imprison yourself maybe in a lower paying job, imprison yourself maybe in a city you never thought you lived in, in a house you never thought you lived in. Imprison yourself maybe beside a a hospital bed, beside someone who's sick. Imprison yourself in, in such a way that you would say, I'll stand here and even though I have the freedom to go, I will stand here because there's a jailer who would be hurt, a jailer who would be lost, a jailer who wouldn't know the direction, wouldn't know the hope if I leave. And so when I persevere through, I will sit in this prison cell until the jailer knows the hope that is the result of my perseverance. This is what Jesus is calling you to if you believe in Jesus. Hope isn't the result for you. Hope is the result for the jailer who needs you to have character to stand in the gap for them. Such a shocking way that they would come to you and say, whatever you got on you, I want it. How do I get it? How do I get it? crazy story and Paul says it best. Same one who lived it and says it. He says not only so but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance character and character hope. He says we glory in our sufferings because our sufferings just might give us a stage to show people what it's like to live with Jesus in your life and when I stand on that stage with character and dance on the suffering with Jesus and I walk in, in with Jesus over the storm that is my life, people will look on and say what in the world is going on and can I have some? That's your role. That's what you're meant to be. That's who you're meant to be. That's grit. That's true grit in your life. And so, for a moment, would you just bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment? Some of you are here and you say, I, I think I'm the jailer. I don't, know, I don't know that Jesus who gives me the hope that causes me to persevere. I don't know about that one. And when I even talk about it today, I speak about that Jesus 
and something starts to stir up in your heart a little bit, something starts to show up, something starts to, start, starts to grab you a little bit, Jesus is calling to you and saying, I want to give you that hope today. I want to give you the same hope that the jailer discovered that day. I want to give you the same hope that allowed Paul and Silas to persevere through prison. I want to give you the same hope that would allow you to persevere through your circumstances. All you have to do is turn to me, welcome me into your life, and then follow me today. You maybe say, that's me. I need to do that. I want to give you the opportunity. Would you just, even in this moment right now, with every eye closed and head bowed, would you just go ahead and raise your hand so I can pray for you? You say, that's me. Yes, God bless you. Pray for you. Is there anyone else here? Yeah, God bless you. And God bless you. I'll pray for you and for you. God bless you. Is there anyone else here who says, that's me, I need it? Yeah, God bless in the back. Anyone else? Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Lord, you see the hands going up. You see the you see the work. You know the work that is going on in hearts today, Jesus. And I just pray that today you would rise up in hope, Lord. You would allow people to see you in a new way. That today you would give the hope that would cause perseverance to rise up, Lord. That these people would know that you are with them. You're walking with them. Your power for them, Jesus. You have purpose for them, Lord. That you have purpose even in their suffering, even in their trials. Lord, let them know you today. Holy Spirit, confirm it in their heart. Confirm what's going on. Speak to them. Lead them. Grow them. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who loves that people just raise their hands, say, Amen. Come on. Come on. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. If you raised your hand, we'd love to get to know you. We feel like there's some next steps for you. We want to do some baptisms with you, which is an amazing testimony. But we'd love to get you in a small group. We'd love to get you serving on team. Uh, we'd love to just chat with you about this or pray. Uh, so fill out a Connect card, hand it into the Info Center. We will contact you this week. For the rest of you, let's go live out the hope that causes us to persevere, that will build us a character that will cause others to see the hope that is in us. Amen? Have a good week. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. The impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. The impossible things in your name, they shall be done.